Hello. Uh, welcome to the next uh, video in this lecture series. <clears throat> um, this one is all about motions in the sky, and I'm warning you right up front, this one's a little bit longer and a little, I don't want to say complicated, but um, we're we'll talking about three-dimensional shapes, things moving in three dimensions. Hold on, mic check. Okay. Um, on a two-dimensional screen, which is not necessarily ideal. Um, so bear with me best as you can. Um, first topic here is going to be mapping the sky. Um, and one way we picture the sky as seen from Earth is to imagine a pretend sphere around the Earth that we call the celestial sphere. Um, this is obviously not a real construct, uh, but it is a really useful way of getting around the sky, thinking of where to point in the sky, what time things are up, where to look, stuff like that. Um, so the stars are all located on certain positions on this sphere, and the ecliptic, this red line, is the path that the sun takes across that sphere over the course of the year. So if you're on Earth, um, we have some, some terminology. Um, the point right overhead for you is zenith. Um, and that is determined by where you all are on Earth, as is the horizon, which is 90 degrees away, that cuts off what you can't see. Um, and your location on Earth also determines where the uh, celestial pole is in your sky. Um, either the North Celestial Pole in the Northern Hemisphere or the South in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and 90 degrees away from that is the uh, Celestial Equator. So we're kind of mapping, so equator, you think, okay, kind of like mapping the Earth's equator up onto the celestial sphere. Hmm. Um, let's see, a couple of other terms to know. Uh, if you are looking at, if you're the observer in the center of this sphere, you have the zenith overhead, the horizon around you. Um, this line that goes from north to south through the zenith is called the meridian. Um, if you're looking at the location of a particular object, such as a star, how high it is above the horizon is its altitude. How many degrees from north it is going clockwise, I guess, east, um, is your azimuth angle. Oh, so here's the meridian. Sorry. Uh -huh. Altitude um, and azimuth. Uh, so the coordinates like they are on Earth are mapped onto the celestial sphere, um, only they're not called latitude and longitude, uh, they're called right ascension and declination. I'm not going to worry too much about that, um, but just imagine that celestial sphere has a grid on it very similarly. So uh, another way of looking at this um, is to pretend you are, well, I guess you are standing on the Earth, pretend you're gigantic standing on the Earth. Um, what's over your head is the zenith, and 90 degrees away is the horizon that limits what you can see. So in reality, you're not this giant thing. You're a teeny tiny speck on the Earth's surface, so the Earth is blocking your view of the rest of that sphere of the sky. Now that depends where you are on Earth. So that's going to change based on your latitude, so how far north or south you are. It's not going to change with your longitude as you go east-west around. That just changes well, what time it is um, where you are in that location. Uh, when we're outside, we use uh, sky maps. Um, so this is an example of a sky map um, from skymaps.com. I always use these in my outdoor labs. Uh, and you use it by... Um, Whatever direction you're facing, so if I was holding it like the way you see on the screen, I'd be facing south, south is at the bottom. If I turn around to face north, I've got to flip the thing so that north is at the bottom, and that shows me what I'm seeing, and the center of that circle is the zenith, it's overhead. So it's a two-dimensional projection of a, you know, half sphere that you're imagining around your head. So some highlights to summarize, things that are useful out of this. Um, the sky above you could be modeled as the inside of a dome, the inside of the celestial sphere. 
The horizon determines what parts of the celestial sphere you can see at any given time. The location of, this is very North Hemisphere centric, the North Pole Star depends on your latitude. Um, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, then the location of the South Celestial Pole that you see depends on your latitude. And the star charts are really helpful for letting you determine the positions of objects in the sky at a specific location. And one thing I forgot to note is specific time. So this is, oh gosh, this is from my first semester <laughs> teaching this course. Uh, and uh, this was, for example, early September 9 p.m. in 2015. Okay. So that gets our uh, that gets our positions around the sky. Next, we're going to talk about how things move over the course of a day. So the stars, as you may know, rise and set. Earth rotates west to east, so stars appear to circle from east to west. If you uh, set a long exposure on a camera, meaning that you you know have a photo but that it's recording for a long period of time on the Earth, uh, you can actually see that motion on the picture. So for example, here is uh, a picture of part of the night sky. Uh, the stars rise in the east and set in the west and make these trails throughout the sky throughout the night. Uh, they're not straight up and down, uh, as you notice. In fact, if you take a picture of the celestial pole, for example, so this uh, is an example of the north celestial pole, um, and you let that run for a couple hours, what you'll see is that the, the star at the north celestial pole doesn't move. All the other stars go around it. Um, and so they make these, these tracks that move around. So it's not quite straight up and down, but it are tracks that rise in the east and set in the west. So the takeaway here, Earth's rotation is responsible for the daily motions of the stars and everything else we're going to talk about in the sky. Um, stars rise or set, uh, rise and set or circle around the celestial pole, depending on where they are in the celestial sphere. If they're close to the pole and you're in the right location on Earth, they're going to look, make these little circles. Um, and again, they follow these circular paths around the inside of that dome, that celestial sphere. So stars don't just move throughout the sky over the course of a day. Uh, things move over the course of days, weeks, months, and years. So the year is another uh, important time frame when talking about the night sky. Um, earlier I showed you the celestial sphere. There is this red dotted line that shows the location of the sun, which is called the ecliptic. Um, this is plotting the position of the sun against the stars for every point in the year. Now, in reality, you go outside, when the sun's out, you can't see the stars because the sun is bright, all that light um, uh, gets bounced around the atmosphere and you see a blue sky, uh, assuming there's no clouds. So in this model, you have to imagine, well, if the sun wasn't bright, if I could see the stars at the same time I saw the sun, this is what constellation or what stars I would see the sun in, in the background. Um, you can actually see this during a total solar eclipse. There's a, a um, brief cup, you know, couple minutes, depending where you are, of, of darkness, and you can see the brightest stars. It's pretty amazing. Um, if you set out a camera and took a picture of the location of the sun at the same time every day, depending on where you are on Earth, you would get a picture sort of like this. The sun isn't always going to stay in the same place every day um, at the same time. Sometimes it's gonna be higher, sometimes it's gonna be lower, and it makes this funky shape here. So the ecliptic shows that the sun is drifting its position with respect to the background stars um, over the course of a year. And that's because there's a slight little difference between what we call a solar day and a sidereal day. Uh, a solar day is how long it takes the sun to go around the sky from our point of view. It's 24 hours. A sidereal day is how long it would take a particular star to go around the sun, uh, excuse me, go around the sky. Uh, it takes 23 hours and 56 minutes. Slight difference because the Earth has moved a little bit in its orbit around the sun, the time it's taken to rotate, so it's got a 
rotate a little bit more um, to get the sun in the same position. Um, the main point is that difference between the stars going around once, the sun going around once, means that the sun is moving through the sky from our point of view. The constellations that the sun appears to be in um, go through, I'm gonna fix this in real time, why not? Um, a certain set of constellations called the zodiac. Uh, so the zodiac constellations might be very familiar to you because um, those are uh, often used in astrology, uh, horoscopes, um, that uh, there are actually 13 now because the sun's path has changed a little bit um, since the these, you know, were these astrological signs were first set down. But anyway, those are um, probably the most well-known constellations, at least their names, um, because of that. But those are just the constellations that the sun appears to look in from where you are. Now, where what the sun looks like from where you live um, is uh, dependent on your location. Oops, hang on, sorry. Ha! Okay, that's what happened. My highlight, my spies got screwed up. Okay, highlights. <laughs> the ecliptic is the sun's path through the sphere. A minor shift of the stars with respect to the sun every day adds up over time. Um, and every month, roughly, the sun is in a different constellation along the ecliptic. Now, where you are on Earth um, determines what the sun's going to look like throughout the day and throughout the year. So from where I am teaching this course in New Hampshire in the United States, um, I am in the Northern Hemisphere. I think my latitude is about 43 degrees. So pretty much like middle of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, if you watch the sun move through the sky over the course of a day, you will see it move in this, you know, path just like the stars that we saw in those star trail photos a bit earlier. Uh, it's going to rise in the east and set in the west, but it's not necessarily, depending on where you are, going to go straight overhead. From where I am, it doesn't go straight overhead. Um, so over the course of the day, it's going to rise, go across, rise in the east, go across the sky, and set. Um, for an observer in the northern hemisphere, for an observer in the Northern Hemisphere, um, the sun will be at its highest in the southern sky. It will be right overhead, as you can see in this image. Now, the reason there's two tracks is because it's showing you where the sun is in the sky on the day of the summer solstice, when the sun is at its highest, and the winter solstice, again, Northern Hemisphere, when the sun is at its lowest. Uh, so there's a significant difference. There's a 47 right 47 degree difference so like that <laughs> do that with your arms that's 47 degrees between where the sun crosses in the middle of the day in summer and in winter um so that may not be obvious to you that was not obvious to me until i actually did a project to observe sunspots when i was, I think it was a science fair project in high school anyway Trying to observe the sun in winter in the north, you know, from higher northern hemispheres, not a great idea. It doesn't get very high in the sky, is my point. Now, where you are on Earth, again, changes that if you are at one of the poles. So, for example, if you're at the North Pole, over the course of a day, the sun and uh, if this is summertime, say, uh, the sun's going to stay above the horizon the whole time. So, if you've ever heard that at the poles, there's six months of daylight and six months of darkness... This is true. This is because of where you are on Earth, the way the sun is rotating. Sorry, excuse me, the way the Earth is rotating. Um, the sun will never set for the North Pole um, in the summer. Uh, if you're at the equator, you see something very different. So imagine you are at the equator. Now the sun uh, can go directly overhead sometimes of the year. Uh, and in fact, this is showing summer solstice and winter solstice. You notice they're just kind of on either side of directly overhead. Um, so all year it's in this band in between. So it's more directly overhead um, for the entire year, you know, just depending what side of the year you want, you're on. 
So highlights from this, uh, the sun's path through the sky over the course of a day can be plotted uh, just like we did for a single star on the inside of that celestial sphere. The sun's path through the sky changes from day to day, season to season, and it totally depends on where you are on Earth. So next up, what causes the seasons? We're talking about, I've already mentioned the winter solstice, the summer solstice, uh, spring and autumn equinoxes. Those are terms you've probably uh, heard of, probably familiar with. Winter solstice is the first day of winter. Uh, it's We know that in the Northern Hemisphere, it's December 21st, the shortest day of the year, longest nighttime. Uh, we went through the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere here not long ago, the time I'm recording this in July. Um, so that was the longest day. Uh, so the sun was out for the longest amount of time um, that day in June. We can see this again using this celestial sphere model. Um, so this is showing um, the path through the sky of the sun on different days um, from a particular location. And they just rotate the sphere around so you can see it from three different angles. Um, what you see is that uh, the summer solstice is when the path is the highest. It rises and sets, again, this is for Northern Hemisphere, uh, north of east, and it goes through a longer path through the sky than it does for the other lines. Longer path through the sky means it's up in the sky longer. So if it's up in the sky longer, that means it's probably gonna be warmer. Okay, that checks out. Also, when it's directly overhead, beaming down on you, the direct sunlight is more concentrated uh, on a particular area, that's also going to heat it up for you, which is why it's warmer in the middle of the day than it is at either beginning or end. So that's summer solstice. Winter solstice is the blue one, that's the lowest. Now you have the sun going through a shorter path in the sky, so it's up in the sky for less time, as we all well know from winters here in New Hampshire. Um, so that uh, less time in the sky means that it's colder, um, or, or is one of the reasons why it's colder. We also have the sun not going to a very high altitude at any point during the day. It's fairly low. The sunlight's more indirect, so we're not getting heated up as much. Uh, and in between, it shows up as green here, but um, green and orange, the spring and autumn equinoxes, would have the same path. You have the sun rising directly in the east and setting directly in the west. But notice it's still not going directly overhead, at least for this observer here in, in the northern hemisphere. Okay, highlights from that. Um, the sun's path through the sky over the course of a day can be plotted, uh, similar to the way you do with a star. And again, this is all dependent on your latitude um, and how that changed. Wow, did I skip backwards? No, I didn't, I'm cool. <laughs> Did it live. Okay, so what causes the seasons? I've already touched a little bit on that um, just in explaining this plot. Um, if you take a look at, so pretend the sun, you know, is in the middle of this, um, kind of like that, this down here. When the earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, I guess it's this way in the video, uh, 23 and a half degrees, from you know the way that it's orbiting the sun so that tilt means some times of the year which you see on the left hand side in the screen um, the northern hemisphere is more tilted towards the sun so it's summer in the northern hemisphere the southern hemisphere it's tilted more away so it's winter in the southern hemisphere so if you have friends in australia or south africa or brazil they have an opposite season from what you have um, you'll see this you know on instagram and twitter all the time um, it's the reverse on the right side of the slide so the northern hemisphere is tilted away it's getting less direct sunlight it's colder the southern hemisphere is tilted towards uh, so it's getting more direct sunlight. And we also know from the previous thing, it's in the sky longer. So it's warmer, it's summer there. Um, there's one year I didn't have a summer solstice because I 
flew to South Africa from North America on the sol like right before the solstice. So I had two winter solstices one year. It was very sad. Um, notice something about this. There's a common uh, idea that the Earth is warmer in summer because it's closer to the sun. But I just told you that the when it's summer in the northern hemisphere, it's winter in the southern hemisphere. So the Earth can't be in two places at once. So that tells you the distance from the sun has nothing to do with it. And in fact, the Earth's orbit is slightly elliptical. Um, we're actually closest to the sun in January. So for those of you in the northern hemisphere, that does not check out. Truthfully, the, the distance is so, so tiny, it really doesn't have an effect on the seasons. It's really due to this tilt, not distance. Uh, like I showed before, the sun's altitude changes with the seasons. If you are taking a picture of the sun at midday every day, um, you're going to have the sun highest at noon and lowest. Uh, oh, sorry, highest at noon in the summer, lowest on the winter solstice. So again, reason for the seasons, it's tilt of the earth, which causes two different phenomena. One is that the light is, when it's more direct, you get a warmer season. Uh, the second one uh, on the left is that when you're tilted towards the sun, the sun's in the sky longer. So the tilt of the earth is the main reason, but it's got two big effects, the time in the sky and how direct the sunlight is. So that axial tilt is the reason for the season, which is a Christmas card I someone always sends every year. Um, so the axis uh, of the earth is what causes uh, these seasonal changes um, and that they're opposite in opposite hemispheres. Last section in talking about motions in the sky is phases of the moon. This is probably one of the favorite topics of astronomy educators to debate on how to teach well. <laughs> it's not super easy. Um, I always, always recommend doing the demo for yourself where you hold a ball up in front of you with a bright light in front of you um, and, you know, move the ball around your head. So like the bright light is the sun, your head is the earth, the ball is the moon. You will see the phases of the moon that way. Google, look up, you know, phases of the moon ball demo and you will, you will find it. Um, cause these two dimensional images are not going to do it justice, but what we do know is that the moon every 27.3 days uh, orbits the earth once um, as it orbits the earth you get a different uh, orientation say from where you are so the first little earth over on the left the uh, moon is in the same direction as the sun from our point of view we're seeing the side of the moon that's not lit we're seeing the side that's dark on the moon currently. So it's seen nighttime. Okay. As the moon moves around the earth, the side facing us gets uh, the, the amount of sunlight it sees changes. And so the amount of sunlight reflected back to us changes. So you go from new moon on the left, you go through what are called the waxing phases where waxing is getting bigger. Uh, goes through a crescent and then first quarter and then the bubbly bit that's not quite full is called gibbous and then full moon and then waning means it's getting smaller every night uh, you go again gibbous to last or third quarter excuse me crescent and then back around to new moon which is where we don't see it in the sky now again because the earth has moved in its orbit around the sun over the course of a month We've got this funky uh, little change here in that uh, it takes 27.3 days for the moon to move around the Earth, but it actually takes 29.5 days for the moon to go through all of its phases as seen by us. Um, so that is the average, I guess, the average uh, month. Again, waxing, waning, it's fuller um, or less full. And whatever side of the moon is lit, that should tell you what direction the sun is in the sky. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Another way to look at this, uh, the moon phases as viewed from Earth are on the left side of this graphic. 
the moon's orbit around the Earth is on the right side. So you've got to match up one to one, day zero, day three, day seven. Um, notice that half the moon is always lit. The other half of the moon's always dark, right? Um, and because of the way the moon always faces the same side to us, um, the same, the side that's lit is not always the same side. That's a little weird. Um, basically, there's no dark side of the moon. <laughs> there's no permanent dark side of the moon. There's a near side that faces Earth and a far side that doesn't face Earth. But a day for, say, someone living on the moon would be, um, would be a month, right? So it would actually, from the time the sun is overhead to time it's uh, all the way around, that would be that 29.5 days. Here's another uh, graphic showing that. Now this is also indicating what time it is at each spot on Earth. Um, due to the fact that the sun's over here, right? So, oh, sorry, eh, you can't see. Sun's on the right. Um, so the part of the Earth that's pointing at the sun is noon, roughly, right? Um, ignoring daylight savings and all that jazz. Uh, the side on the other side is midnight. Now, all these little moons and these times tell you that there's a relationship between what time it is, where you are, and what phase the moon is in. Uh, so you can impress your friends once you figure this system out and, uh, you know, if they ask you what time it is instead of looking at your wrist, you can look at the moon and be like, it's, bad, it's like 9 p.m. Um, and you might get fairly close. Um, it's a complicated system. I would recommend that you go to one of like the many astronomy simulations to play with that. Um, or you can take this graphic and look at this graphic and say, okay, I'm pretending I'm at the noon spot. Um, and every day at noon, I'm going to see where the moon is compared to me. Um, when it's at, so for example, when it's in the new phase, all the way on the right, um, means I can't see the moon. If I could see the moon, it would be overhead at noon with the sun. Cool. Uh, it would rise at sunrise and set at sunset. That makes sense. Now let's go to the other side, the left side to the full moon. Uh, it's on the opposite side of the earth as the sun, which means on that left side, it's midnight. The moon is overhead at midnight or at its highest at midnight when it's full. It's going to rise at sunset and set at sunrise. So it's opposite the sun in the sky. So those are the two easiest to figure out. Um, the others, I always mess them up, so I always have to think about that. But if you're at 6 p.m., say that's roughly sunset. Um, as it's roughly sunset, the, it's 6 p.m., it's roughly sunset. The first quarter moon, it's above the 6 p.m., so it's highest in the sky. Um, so you can trace all of these, all of these phases and figure out what time they're overhead, what time they rise, what time they set. Okay, brief overview of that. The phases of the moon as observed from the Earth are determined by the relative positions of the sun, Earth, and moon. Notice there were no shadows involved at all. Um, the moon phases indicate how much of the moon's illuminated surface is visible from the Earth. So half the moon's always lit. It just depends, oh, the phase is dependent on how much of that lit side we see. So, all right, thank you so much. That's it for Motions in the Sky, and I will see you soon.